Well, it's our great pleasure to host uh, Professor Joe Bowler from Stanford today, who is a professor in mathematics education. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, um, what I want to talk about today is really two big messages. And oh, let's see if I can pull in my own slides. Um, I want to maybe help change the way you may be thinking about math and about ability and also think about ways and the importance of dissociating math from speed. So I'll start by saying that, um, as you just heard, I wrote a book for teachers and parents, and the US version is up there as well as the version in the UK. And that went out a few, year, a few years ago, but it was really interesting when I wrote that book, it took me on a journey, a really interesting journey of talking to lots of media and politicians and members of the public that I don't normally talk to. And, one of the things I realized from that journey was just how many people are traumatized by math, how pervasive that is, and how damaging that is. And, you know, many of the interviews, that I, I, I conducted about 40, or I took part in about 40 interviews about the book uh, across the U.S. and across the U.K., and virtually every single one of the presenters started off by saying to me that they were terrified of math. So... Um, as an example of one of this, actually the example I want to use with you is not a radio presenter, but she was somebody I met as part of that whole journey. And I want you to, um, to be introduced to Vivian because she illustrates something so important, and that's this. Vivian is a top scientist. She is vice chair of council for University College London. She's a member of the Medical Research Council. She presents BBC TV science programs. And last year, she was awarded the OBE, that's kind of hidden by her picture, uh, which is a medal that the Queen gives for the very top service in the country. So what's interesting about Vivian is she's terrified of math, absolutely terrified. And you can hear a bit from Vivian. We're going to listen to her. I gave a talk at the Royal Institution last year, in, a couple of years ago in London. That's a picture of the Royal Institution. And Vivian introduced me at that talk. So let's just listen a little bit to what Vivian had to say. Well, I, well I, the reason that I think I'm here chairing this is because um, I did a program for Radio 4 about uh, dyscalculia and had myself tested, and I was shamingly bad at maths and a couple of oh, two or three weeks ago Lenny Henry and I did a program together where we talked about our awful awful maths experiences at schools uh, and when I uh, did this program I said that I was reduced to sobbing in the corner because Mrs Glass my maths teacher made me stand there because I couldn't do my seven times table. And do you know, five women called the BBC Action Line and said, was it Mrs. Glass of Rooksbury Park? <laughs> <clears throat> and do you know, ladies and gentlemen, it surely was. And ever since then, one of the things that uh, we uh, were both saying uh, was that we always thought that people who could do maths were clever. So that if you couldn't do maths, it must mean that you weren't clever. And both Lenny Henry and I had this secret shape, well, not so much secret, um, all our lives about being bad at maths. And I was always afraid that Mrs. Glass would jump out when I was at the BBC, tap me on the shoulder and say, that's it, Parry, you've had your lot. We've discovered you. So uh, maths really uh, has an enormous effect uh, on children's lives, and it can, bad teaching can blight their lives. So I am delighted to introduce Professor Joe. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Turn your microphone back on. Turn your microphone back on. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, hear me? I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. 
Okay. So um, hopefully there aren't too many Mrs. Glass math teachers out there, but still, still. But we know that math um, is regularly used to traumatize kids in classrooms. And this is Vivian talking about that in her life. She says, this has pursued me through my whole life. It is so undermining of your whole being to be so bad at maths, you just feel so stupid. So I wanted to share that just to point out that we have nations of math traumatized people, and that trauma cuts across achievement levels, cuts across social class. It's really a huge, huge problem. So part of that trauma um, and bad experience comes from a myth about mathematics it's very pervasive and the myth is this it says that uh, it's an idea that being good at math is a gift some people are naturally good at math and some are not so I'm going to knock down that myth for you today and um, that's an important thing to do so I mentioned or I showed you my book in England which was called the elephant in the classroom and I called it that because I argued that there's a big elephant standing in most math classrooms and it's the idea that only some kids are going to be good at maths. Teachers believe that. Parents believe that. It's extremely damaging. So let's look at that idea for a minute. Some of the most recent evidence that's really important that's coming out on the brain um, that everybody's talking about is some very new and important evidence around brain plasticity. So this is what we now know that when you learn something, a synapse fires in your brain. It's like an electrical uh, connection. And synapses are a little like footprints in the sand in that the brain will keep following these footprints and make them deeper and more established the more that they're worked on and followed. Um, I think I missed something there, but never mind. But if they're not followed, they will tend to wash away um, like water on the beach. So you have to keep using um, those ideas and that learning strengthens synapses but the plasticity of the brain and this is super important means that these connections keep growing all the time into adulthood which is good news for us adults if pathways aren't followed they can be discarded it's the you know use it or lose it idea so what's been stunning scientists recently though is just how plastic brains are how changeable they are and i want to give you a couple of examples of that so I'll introduce you to the life of a London black cab driver. Um, in London, the streets are very complex. And to, part, to become a black cab driver in London, you have to pass a test, which is called the knowledge. Now, London is made up of 25,000. Well, to pass this test, you have to learn 25,000 streets and 20,000 landmarks in London. So what they find is... What they're now finding is that London taxi drivers actually have a larger hippocampus in their brain at the end of that training period. And um, so the hippocampus is the part of the brain that, that holds sp complex spatial information. So when they go through that training peri period, it actually grows. When they stop being taxi drivers, it shrinks back down again. And a second example um, that stunned scientists was a girl who had half of her brain removed because she was having fits. And she was paralyzed at first because the brain uh, communicates to the muscles in the body and doctors expected um, doctors expected that to last for a long time. She amazed them by recovering the functions from that side of the brain. So it, she had growth in her brain much faster than anybody thought. And then perhaps, you know, the most interesting for me in my work is that a three-week math program, three-week training program, working on uh, skills for math, change the structures of participants' brains. That's how quickly people's brains can change. They can change in a second, but the actual structure of their brain changed from that three-week period. So neuroplasticity um, refers to the lifelong capacity of the brain to change and rewire itself. So brain research actually is telling us that every single child can excel in mathematics in school from elementary to high school. There are, you know, of course, kids with a very particular special need or, you know, dyslexia or particular needs that can um, get in the way of that. But it's really important to understand, of course, we can work with those special needs and still bring about excellence and that everybody, it's not the case that some people can do well in maths and others can't, which is the idea that's so pervasive. Uh, every new learning experience changes your ability. 
Um, but we use fixed ability language all the time. We talk about high and low kids. We talk about smart and not smart kids. So just to show you how important these ideas are for students, for your children, for you, um, I want to talk a little bit about the research of Carol Dweck. And she, um, you may know of her, she's an extremely well-known guru on mindset, but she published a book that caused a huge, had a huge impact where she showed that people have one of two mindsets. They have a fixed mindset where they believe that intelligence is somewhat fixed. Uh, math ability is a gift would fit into that. And then there are people with a growth mindset who believe that the more you work, the smarter you grow. And it turns out that these, be, these people, these different mindsets have huge impact on people's behavior and on their success in school. So, um, and it affects students from across the achievement spectrum. In fact, high achieving girls are some of the worst hit by fixed mindsets. And parents, it turns out, play a big role in encouraging those mindsets. And in fact, the very common US um, practice of telling kids they're smart is one of the reasons that um, so many kids develop a fixed mindset. Because when parents say to kids to be you know, encouraging and nice, oh, you're so smart, it's great, you can do that, you're very smart. Um, it gives kids the idea, oh, you know, I'm smart, it's good, that's good, I could do that, I'm smart. But then when they fail, and they will, they develop the idea, well, maybe I'm not so smart. So this graph just shows um, a seventh grade class of students, they gave a questionnaire to see whether they were fixed or growth mindset. And the, part, the line shows their achievement over the year. So you can see that those with a fixed mindset um, so I'm, I'm seeing this comment that people aren't seeing the right graphs. I don't know why. Um, I'm not sure what I can do about that. But um, anyway, those with a, for me, uh, for not saying it's fine over here. So anyway, um, what we see is that those with a fixed mindset go through seventh grade, sort of slightly declining, where those with a growth mindset accelerate in their learning. And this shows you what happens when kids with a fixed mindset were given um, an intervention. And they were given that intervention. Most kids were declining as they went through seventh grade, but the kids who got that intervention immediately changed their trajectory. And that intervention was about communicating to kids that um, they can achieve anything, their brain can grow, communicating growth mindset information. Just a quick slide on gender. It turns out, as I said, girls are most hit by this. They did a study where they gave fifth grade girls something really hard to do. And what they found was, so they gave all fifth grade students something really hard to do. What they found was the boys were much better able to cope with that failure and that those with those who scored higher on an IQ test could cope with the failure best. But the girls, um, the higher their score on an IQ test is uh, the more difficulty they had. So that was really interesting. And at the end of eighth grade, there's, there's only a gender gap amongst fixed mindset students. So mindset is hugely important. You can read Carol Dweck's book for more information on that, but it's very particularly important for math, where most people have fixed ideas about maths. So I just want to share one message uh, that is extremely important that comes from the mindset literature, and that is this. Every time a student makes a mistake in math, they grow a new synapse. So it actually turns out that making mistakes in math is the most useful thing kids can be doing. So this was really significant for me because I know that most kids, virtually every student of math feels terrible when they make a mistake. They think, oh, I'm not a math person, I can't do math. But it turns out they, that making mistakes is super helpful. That is when your brain fires more than any other time. So it's really important we communicate this message to kids um, I'm telling teachers all the time that they should start lessons by saying, you know, I love mistakes. Mistakes are the time you learn the most. Um, and they should be giving kids work and parents should be giving kids work that they will make mistakes on. It really doesn't help them to be doing work that they're getting correct all the time. And they need to understand the importance of mistakes. Another, so this is my second big message um, before I finish presenting. And that is the speed that math is often associated with. So one of the big findings that are coming out from neuroscience is the finding that math should never be associated with speed. And the time tests 
cause the early onset of math anxiety. I was horrified when I moved to the US three years ago and I have daughters in elementary school that they were given time tests um, that look like this. 50 questions to finish in three minutes from first grade upwards. And that is pretty common across the US. So what's the problem with this? Well, one thing is math, it, math classrooms everywhere on a speed. They reward those kids who are fastest. But actually, great mathematical thinkers, including mathematicians, um, are some of the slowest thinkers I know. In fact, mathematicians are the slowest thinkers I know. And uh, I don't say that to be insulting to mathematicians, but um, I want you to listen to this quote now, which comes from a top mathematician. He won the Fields Medal in maths, which is the, like the Nobel Prize for mathematics. And this was him reflecting on his school days. He said, I was always deeply uncertain about my own intellectual capacity. I thought I was unintelligent. And it's true that I was and still am rather slow. I need time to seize things because I always need to understand them fully. Even when I was the first to answer the teacher's questions, I knew it was because they happened to be questions to which I already knew the answer. But if a new question arose, usually students who weren't as good as I was answered before me. Towards the end of the 11th grade, I secretly thought of myself as stupid, and I worried about this for a long time. I'm still just as slow. At the end of 11th grade, I took the measure of the situation and came to the conclusion that rapidity doesn't have a precise relation to intelligence. What's important is to deeply understand things and their relations to each other. And this is where intelligence lies. I'll just say that again. What's important is to deeply understand things and their relations to each other. The fact of being quick or slow isn't really relevant. Naturally, it's helpful, like it is to have a good memory, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient for intellectual success. So I just want to underscore that message because often in math classrooms, kids who are working slowly, possibly because they're thinking deeply about the ideas, are put off math because they think that math is all about speed. So I said that um, time tests uh, the onset of early math anxiety, and I'll show you a little bit about how that works. So what we know is that we, when you have math facts that you need for fast time tests, like, you know, 15 times 2 is 30, we hold that information in our working memory in our brain. And what the scientists have found out is that when you're put under any stress, such as time pressure, or another example you might relate to is having to do math publicly, being in a restaurant where you have to calculate a tip with everybody looking at you. Those are stressful situations. And what happens in those moments is it blocks the working memory. So you can no longer access the math that you know. So what's very stressful for kids is they take these time tests. They think they can do the math. They're stressed. Their working memory becomes blocked and they perform terribly, which gives, sets up a whole you know, future of math anxiety. Um, and that stress, the kids who are stressed on time tests, does not relate to achievement. It goes across the uh, achievement spectrum, but it does particularly affect girls. So um, I want to show you now the, I, I asked teachers to get their fourth graders and second graders just to write down how they felt after a time test, it's actually my daughter's school, and these are some of the responses. So first from the fourth graders. Worried that I won't finish. I feel nervous because I don't like tests that much. I feel nervous because I'm afraid I won't finish or make a mistake. I feel nervous. I know my facts, but it just scares me. I feel pressured. Um, so our constant feelings of nervousness, scared, anxiety, you know, pressure. And these are the second graders. Not quite as great with their spelling. Um, not great. Upset, nervous, unhappy, that I'm not good at math. So these are messages we don't want to be sending to kids that set them on, you know, once kids lose their confidence in math, they, they can go on a whole negative pathway that's very hard to get off. So um, this was a very short presentation that I just wanted to inject those two ideas about speed and about um, how we think about math and ability that are very important. I have currently actually opened yesterday an online class um, for parents and for teachers that has a lot more information in and also about things to do about these ideas. So if you want to learn more about it, 
It's free. Um, there's, it, as I said, it opened yesterday. I'm kind of crazy dealing with it now because about 30,000 people are taking it. But um, that's a good place to, to get more depth on these ideas. So that's all I was going to share today. And um, maybe we could move to questions. Just switching back on here. You know, I asked this a question. Okay. And, you know, maybe because the I'll I'll, um, I'll put it in the chat box, and I encourage other people to use the chat box. But I'm going to reduce the feedback here from my. So. Um, you want me to answer these, right, with talking, I think. Um, how do you feel about calculators is the question. And so um, somebody's requesting to speak. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure how to handle that. So calculators are, you know, neither good nor bad. I mean, it really depends what you do with calculators. Um, you, certainly, what's really important, it's very important for students to understand numerical work and to get a good sense of numbers and number sense. And um, calculators can play a part in that, and they can also play a part in helping kids do really important math work. I mean, actually, pr probably um, performing the calculation is just one tiny part of math. So sometimes calculators can be really useful for people to engage in a problem and think mathematically and to reason and do all these important math uh, ways of working. And then have a calculation, which is the least important part, be done by a calculator. I work in that way all the time. So yeah, calculators are fine to be used in school. It really depends what people do with them. And we don't want kids to be dependent on them and not be able to work with basic numbers without a calculator. But they're an important part of education. So are there any other questions? I'm just looking. We learned through rote memory. How do you work with learning through math mistakes? So um, just to address the first part of that, I mean, learning math by rote is not helpful, not a good way to learn math and will stop kids doing well at some point. You know, some kids get a certain way by learning by rote and being able to reproduce on tests, but most people do not. And they're missing out on how um, the most important learning that they need. So um, the thing with mistakes is to embrace mistakes, to talk about their value and how important they are, to give kids uh, questions that are about mathematical reasoning where they need to think about different ways. So in my course, one of the things I talk about is number talks. So number talks are great things to do with kids um, where you ask students to try and think of different ways to solve a problem. So one I frequently use is um, 8 times 15. And uh, no, 18 times 5. 18 times 5 is my kind of favorite one. You ask any room of people to work out 18 times 5 in their head without paper and paper, they will think about that in five or six different ways, still coming to a solution. So that's the important math work that's really helpful for kids to see different pathways. Um, and when they make a mistake, we have to say that is great that you just made that mistake because that's when your brain is firing. That's so important. And it also gives us a place to think about that mistake and think about why it works. So I'm going to track back to the see. I see lots of questions coming up. Um, so this person said, as a teacher at a high performing grammar school, I'm very concerned about the growing trend in teaching towards timed controlled assessments. I feel pupils rarely perform to the best of their ability, but the UK government seems hell bent on pursuing this route. What do you think? So yeah, the UK government, particularly Mr. Gove, is hell bent on pursuing many things that are extremely damaging for kids. Um, and this is one of them, putting in timed assessments, encouraging more rote learning. Uh, it's 
you know, awful, and we have to try and stand up against it as much as we can. Um, I try and do that, and we need to do it and help individual schools and other places realize how bad some of these ideas are. So, uh, you know, it's okay. Sometime people might have to do a timed assessment, maybe when they're 16 or at the end of the course. But what's important to understand is you don't help kids do better on timed assessments by giving them timed assessments. If you give them lots of timed assessments, they develop math anxiety and become very slow. Um, so this is a, a misconception that we prepare students for tests by giving them more tests. Actually, that's the worst thing we can do. So yeah, I'm sorry about the um, what's happening in the UK. It's really pretty awful. Um, more, as I said, more in my there's more in my course on this. Do you think dyscalculia is a specific learning difficulty or just poor teaching and fear? So I have to say I take the latter approach, that I think dyscalculia is, does come from very bad teaching and from fear of math. Um, I think, you know, there, there are all sorts of special needs that kids have to deal with and different processing issues and all sorts of things. And there are kids who have processing issues that really make certain aspects of math difficult. But this sort of, um, so, you know, maybe that we could call that dyscalculia, but there, a lot of people think they have dyscalculia when actually they've had very bad or even typical math teaching um, and have developed all sorts of ideas about themselves as a learner and about what math is that have developed into this crippling condition when they see math. Um, So I'm seeing a number of questions that are particularly about dyslexic children, which I I'm, I don't know that I'm the greatest expert to answer some of these. Um, like one I'm seeing, how can a parent or teacher address the issue of the math sign plus slash times multiplied by from being mistaken for each other in a math problem? So um, I mean, one of the things I teach in the course is the value of a thinking process as people go through math problems. One of the problems is a lot of kids and adults think that you should see a math problem and immediately come up with a method or a solution. And actually, when I do a math problem or when any um, math, you know, people who are comfortable with math do math problems, they go through a process. So one of the things I suggest doing is to start with a problem, to read the problem, read it out loud, think about what information you have, just stay in that place um, and to, you know, really process that for some time. So I think the speed element of having to quickly work with symbols and move on certainly plays into that. Um, somebody's asked what, what my perspective on Montessori math is. I think Montessori math is great. Uh, all math approaches need good teachers and, um, you know, you really need it to be taught well, but their emphasis on Visuals. Visuals are extremely important in math. I would teach the whole of math through visuals if, you know, if I were designing a curriculum and on understanding. Montessori really uh, emphasized understanding. I was in a Montessori school last week and the parent was saying to me, you know, the parents here love what we do. It was a private school. They love the Montessori approach. And in our math, we're four grade levels above the, um, the where we should be or where, you know, where we're expected to be, yet still parents worry about the Montessori math and they come to us saying, you know, shouldn't they do other sort of math? And to me, that's a response that's uh, because so many people have this idea that math has to be taught one way, which is the way they were taught it, which is very rote. So, I mean, Montessori is definitely one of the better approaches that are out there. Um Someone has written, I really see the constraints that time tests place on math thinking. However, my school believes that being automatic, in fact, is important. And does math minutes as a component of math? Parents love it too because it's so tangible and something they can do with their kids. How do you think this is best addressed? Okay, so um, automaticity does not come from time tests. Time tests are a test that assess kids. And what happens when we give a lot of those kind of tests or ma minute math is that those kids who are fast, stay fast, and those kids who are slow, stay slow. It really is not a process for helping kids with automaticity. So in my uh, class, in I think the uh, fifth week, 
I teach a process, uh, uh, an approach for teaching automaticity, which helps kids become more fluent and also at the same time gives them a conceptual understanding of math and number. That is so important. One of the damaging things when we relate math to speed, when we do time tests or mad minutes or whatever they're called, one of the most damaging things is kids get the overwhelming sense that that's what math is. That's what's valuable in math, being able to recall facts quickly. And that is a terrible message to give kids. They should see math as this beautiful subject, a way of interpreting the world where there are many different perspectives and many different ideas. So we've got to get away from that idea of math because that idea of math is really damaging. Um, so what is the best way to help a child who already has math anxiety? Um, that, you know, that's half the kids in this country, and I know it's a really terrible uh, place to be in. Actually, my own daughter, who's in uh, fourth grade, doesn't feel great about math. She had some terrible experiences at school in England, actually, where she was, you know, really told that she was unintelligent. And, you know, I, she's a work in progress. I'm really having to work with her to come around it. Um, um, one example I'll tell you with her, and then I'll talk more generally, is that we happened to be in a third grade class together recently. She was in, was in fourth grade at the time, and she, the teacher put a question, two questions up on the board, and she got one of them right and one wrong. And the one she got wrong, she went, oh, you know, I should have subtracted, I added, or whatever. And she immediately said, oh, I'm so bad at math, I'm terrible, I'm worse than third graders. Um, the whole negative talk started, and... I said, you know what just happened when you took those problems? When you took that question and got it right, nothing happened in your brain at all. When you did that question and got it right, your brain actually grew. That was when you really, you know, it was the best, greatest time for you. So this is the sort of way we have to help kids understand um, how math learning develops. So the other thing um, about math anxiety I, this course that's currently online is for teachers and parents to get, give them the ideas they need about how learning and math and what's important and not good. Next, in the school year, I'm going to release a version for students, and it's going to be a kind of intervention to help students, because we know that students who have math anxiety and uh, many adults in general and people who struggle with math have just gone down the wrong path in math a long time ago often where they come to believe that math is lots and lots of facts they have to remember um, and that they're not a math person that they really can't do it so I have uh, taught a kind of intervention class at Stanford with math traumatized Stanford students um, to get them out of that way of thinking and to change their relationship with maths and it was so successful I'm going to try doing that online so in the school year coming up, that will be released as a student intervention. So um, there are also some great books on math anxiety. So if you Google math anxiety, uh, there's some really good literature out there about how to help your kids with that. So the uh, question is, can you explain how the brain grows from math mistakes? So we are getting very recent evidence just to, you know, in, recent, in the past year, in the past months, where they're able to do so much more with brain scans. And what they know is, when they've monitored people's brains, is that when they make a mistake in, in their math problem, sparks grow in their brain. It's as simple as that. Every time they make a mistake, the sparks grow that are, are they show their brain in the most productive mode. Then when they realize the mistake and, um, or you know, react to it more more in more awareness, another spark fires. So what they're finding is that these, these are the most important learning moments for the brain. They know it from brain scans and looking at the way brain works. And I give the actual evidence for that in the course, in references. Um, so I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. What they also know is that that brain growth is greatest for people with a growth mindset. So they looked at that data, they looked at brain growth, they looked at the neurological basis of it, and they found that those whose brains grew the most were those who had a growth mindset, who believed that mistakes were positive. So again, that just underscores how important that mindset is for math and for everything else. Uh, 
Are there any other questions? Maybe I missed some. Let me go back. Um, oh yeah, great question. How much math homework should a student have? Um, ideally, in my, in my ideal world, I would say none. I think homework, uh, you know, the time kids are at home is a time to play and explore and do other things. Um, so minimal or none at all. We do know that schools that have chosen to abandon homework completely have seen either no impact on achievement or the achievement's actually gone up. Um, so that, you know, ideally I would say no homework. And what's really important though in the home environment and what I would give, the advice I would give to parents about what to do uh, with students at home is to work on math puzzles and math games. They help more than anything um, for kids in the early years. Any game with a dice is really helpful. Um, Sudoku, there's all sorts of math puzzles and games that are out there. Um, in my course, I interviewed somebody who was a you know, really high math achiever. She won the European Scientist of the Year Award when she was 16 in Ireland for inventing a new math algorithm. Um, but she wrote a book, which was really interesting, um, and her name's Sarah uh, Flanagan. She wrote a book called Encode, Flannery, sorry, Encode. And she, I interviewed her in my course, but she talks about how all of her math ability that she got didn't come from anything she did in classrooms that came from doing one puzzle with her dad uh, each night. So I think that's really, really interesting. Okay, questions? So this person said, I'm interested in how you can cultivate an interest in big picture math which dyslexic kids do well, but in, the, uh, but in the case of my son, perceives that he can't do math because of troubles with times tabled and times tests, time tests. So um, that's the big picture math that you're referring to is what's really useful for him and will really help him in the world and in life. That's exactly what we need, uh, people need in, in work and in industry. Uh, unfortunately, our schools are being slow to recognize that. So one thing to do is keep giving them the message. I mean, I'm constantly giving my kids a message. Don't, you know, don't, as well as campaigning with schools to try and stop things like time tests, I'm telling them that is not math. The math that's really important is those big questions and thinking and visualizing and making sense of things. Um, and although you're up against it because schools are giving a different message, at least they are hearing that. And we need to keep valuing that way of thinking. So also, you know, he would be well, Probably the course I'm doing is, you know, it's really intended to help kids like that in particular because they see what's valuable in math and a whole way of thinking in math that they can take on um, that is nothing like time tests. So I saw some other questions. So as many not confident teaching math are the good online math programs that you recommend um, I don't recommend the Khan Academy because that's a very, uh, you know, a lot of people use the Khan Academy. Um, you know, it's great for some things. I think it's free and that's great and it help, helps people who need a review. But as far as learning concepts, it's, you know, we know that that's not a good way because it's basically telling kids and then testing them. So there are a number of good online programs and apps. I just can't come up with them right off the top of my head. They, again, are listed in the course. Um, and some of them are also in that book. Um, so if you, you know, you're not a confident math parent, I think this the course will really help you and give you different ideas to use. So how do you recommend managing a math mistake once it's been identified? Is identifying the error part of the process. So um, ideally, the students themselves will see that they've made an error rather than telling them that they've made an error. Um, and, but once the error is identified, uh, it's really good to just see it as a perfect place for exploring and um, thinking about the ideas because, you know, it's a, 
always an area that millions of people have made before them, but also um, it's that place that people can unpack what was I, you know, what was I thinking there? What's a new way of thinking? This is such a rich place for learning. So spending time in error as a parent or a teacher, I would say, great, this is great. You made that error. It's so important. Now you're at the perfect place. Your brain has grown. You're in the greatest place for learning this. So, um, Someone has written, for the course that you offer, is there paper notes you offer as well? I guess the paper version is the book that I, I have out. Um, there's a running transcript alongside the video of the course, but I'm not sure if that's as helpful as reading the book, probably. So the book in the U.S. is called What's Math Got to Do With It? And it has a lot of these ideas in it. Um, yeah, the other question. How do you apply your message to high school level math, which is what was college level math a generation ago? Yes, exactly. Um, so the, the message is extremely important for high school students. High school students are often uh, deeply traumatized. They've gone through a lot of scarring experiences and they more as much as anyone, maybe more than anyone, need a kind of intervention in the way they think about math. They need to... Um, understand that mistakes are important, they need to be given rich mathematics experiences. So you're a little tied if you're in a school district where they don't give rich experiences, they give drill, um, because we know that that's not good for kids. So um, try and offer them different experiences. The number talks that I mentioned, where you explore with students different ways that numbers are built and how to group them and regroup them, is... Um, Interestingly, those problems, like I talked about the problem of 18 times 5, I can give exactly the same problem to third graders and high schoolers, and the third graders do better on the problems when they're not you know, using an algorithm because they, are, they have number sense at, in third grade. Often by high school, they'll give out ridiculous answers. They're absolutely unable to do anything without an algorithm. They really show that they don't have number sense. So those kids need these sort of methods maybe more than others. Um, a shocking piece of data I came across um, this past year is that the two-year college system uh, in the US, um, which I'm sure you know, currently about half of students are in, two, in two-year colleges in the US. 70% of those students are placed into remedial math classes, 70%. And only one in 10 of them complete the class. That means for the rest of them, they have to leave college. So math is the end of the road for them. And that tells us, you know, what what's going on in high school as much as anything and what we're doing to kids in high school, that they then have to repeat high school classes, um, often given in the same way to the same math, traumatized people and so that they can't get through. So it's really important to change kids' orientation to math. Um, so I love somebody said written saying that they're a fan of the fun math games um, and puzzles on a site called P Interest. Um, op Interest? Pin. 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 Trust. <laughs> anyway, it's, on, it's in the chat box. Um, there are some fantastic books. Martin Gardner is an author of wonderful books of math puzzles. Um, and, you know, there are many, many, many out there. So big question. Somebody's asked, what do I mean by a rich math experience? Um, so a good math experience, if you walk into a classroom, is when kids are given complex problems to solve that are complicated. Uh, maybe one problem or two or three problems to solve in a math lesson where they have to think and reason about math and connect different methods. Very important that students are talking about math uh, all the time. Silent math classrooms are, you know, a big red flag for me because one of the most important things kids do mathematically that mathematicians do that's just an intrinsic part of mathematics is to reason, to think about why methods work and how they work. And it's very hard for kids to reason about math in silence. So we need them to be talking, sharing ideas, their math ideas, thinking about why they work, um, thinking about why others work. So great complex problems, having kids talking, not having ability grouping, which is a whole other subject, which you know we won't talk about today, but we could 
So tracking is one of the most damaging things we do to kids in this country. The countries that top the world in math achievement don't have tracking. Um, interestingly, the countries that top the world in math achievement also don't teach any formal math till kids are seven. Up until that point, they're just exploring with shapes and numbers. In the US and the UK is even worse. We teach formal math to kids when they're four and five. And so by the time they're six, they're already thinking that this subject is confusing, too hard. Um, so yeah, we have a long way to go in create and having those rich math experiences be commonplace in math classrooms. So I have a big question, how did I become interested in math? I'll come back to that one. And then the question, um, do you recommend that when an error is made that the student redo the problem himself until he or she gets it right once the teacher has pointed out the error? So I guess that depends. Um, there are some situations where the greatest thing you can do is ask kids to rethink it and they have enough uh, ideas and confidence that they will rethink about it and get to the solution themselves and that's perfect. Um, sometimes just having a kid ask you a question sometimes so often with me in math classrooms. If somebody says I'm stuck, I say Try and, what's your actual question? Think carefully about what question you have. When they form a question, they suddenly realize the solution. So just having them think about it and speak it and go through it again is great. There are times where kids just feel they don't have any other way to think about it, that they're stuck. Um, and then sending them back can be very frustrating. So it's, it's also really good to say to kids, you know, this is great problem. This is a great, I'm sorry, this is a great mistake. It's a really important one. I mean, mistakes that are a slip in numbers are not the greatest mistake, so it's just a calculation error. But if kids make a conceptual mistake, um, you know, we can say this is a great mistake, it's really important, let's talk about this, and let's talk about the ideas. So it's fine for teachers and parents to introduce new ideas and teach. Each in that moment, but the most important thing is to preface that with the messages about how important mistakes are. Um, are you a spiral or a mastery math advocate? So I think I'll make that the last question followed by how did I become interested in math and then I guess we're out of time. But um, I am not an advocate of spiral curriculum. Um, my students are in a curriculum that's a spiraled math curriculum and I, it, I can see no sense in it at all. I know no research on learning that it's based on. I mean, it's amazing to me that uh, publishers are able to produce math textbooks in the US and elsewhere with no recourse to what we know from learning. Um, so yeah, my kids do one topic one day and then switch to another topic the next day and another topic the next day with no connection between them. The topics are completely randomly, it seems, chosen. Um, that is not a good way to teach math. They should be able to go into depth on topics and really understand them um, for as long as that needs to happen. So, you know, this switching from topic to topic is, you know, I, no, I'm not a fan of that. And then I guess the last question, how did you become interested in math? Um, so for me, I, uh, when I was in school, when I, I remember being in high school and being pretty good at math, you know, I did well in class, but my friends didn't. And I was really interested even then, they would ask me for help and I would help them at how uh, ineffective the math teaching was for them to understand and even the math help the teacher gave wasn't very effective for them either and I remember being really interested in that then um, and then I actually went to university and I first did a psychology degree and I wanted to become an educational psychologist and you teach for two years so I decided to teach math and um, I ended up just really loving teaching maths and I then went on and did a degree in maths and a, ma a master's in math education but really what I loved about it was the learning of maths. That's what I really was super interested in math. I could have you know done more pure mathematics but that wasn't as interesting to me as um, how people think and learn maths which I've you know continued to be super fascinated by. So I guess we're out of time. I have to go off for another three o'clock meeting um but thanks thanks for being here did you want to add anything um finette <laughs>
Um, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, you're just a total hero, Joe. We really appreciate this, and and so many people are going to be helped um, by your pep talk and by by your thoughts about mathematics. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks for connecting. And <laughs> Fantastic. Yay. <good> <laughs>